Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Lifting the Lid on Cancer Inequalities, Where's the Data? Thank you for joining us this evening for this very important conversation. There are so many inequalities when it comes to cancer that affects the way people experience their cancer diagnosis, treatment and post-treatment support. Tonight is all about asking difficult questions so we can reflect and ultimately look at how we can work together to ensure that the support right across the cancer pathway becomes more equitable, more accessible, and takes into account everyone's needs so that care is personalized for all and not just the lucky few. As a charity, Trex dares to be different, breaks down taboos and listens to our community. So we lift the lid on topics that matter to them, and this is one of them. Some of the best experts are those who have lived experience of these issues. And so tonight, joining our guest speakers, who are all specialists in their field, we have three young adults to tell us just how much these issues affected the care they received. This event has been a long time in the making. It all began in 2018 with a conversation that I had with Saima Thompson, co-founder of Masala Wala Cafe, who was herself diagnosed with lung cancer in her 30s, which she sadly died from last year. Saima is greatly missed by so many, and this evening is dedicated to her memory and is a pledge to continue the work she started. Saima was a wonderful person who had incredible courage in the face of adversity. She was a Trekstock Young Adult Ambassador, the founder of the BAME Cancer Support Group, an incredible advocate and a force to be reckoned with. She challenged me, and I'm sure she challenged many of you. She helped open my eyes to the lack of representation and cultural awareness in the cancer space, including at Trekstock. This led to our first Lifting the Lid event on cancer and the BAME community hosted at Simon's Restaurant where we heard stories of just how deep-rooted the beliefs are about cancer in different communities, how the word cancer doesn't even exist in some languages, so it's never even talked about, how people would not talk about their diagnosis to the way prosthetics and wigs for people of colour aren't even available on the NHS. Tonight, we will be hearing from one of the event attendees, Charlene, who was diagnosed with bone cancer in her 30s. She's a passionate advocate of people of colour and was the star of the pioneering Black Women Rising photography exhibition. We also did a second event at Maggie's West London, hosted by the amazing Toral Shah, who will be our host again this evening. This year, we also lifted the lid on cancer in the LGBTQI community, where we heard from Stuart lived through this about his experience of being queer and diagnosed with cancer, which we will, will be talking about tonight. Stuart has always challenged us in our need to be more inclusive in our representation. We will also hear from Brad, a friend of Saima, a friend of Trekstock, and the founder of the app Alike, about experiencing of, of being gay and diagnosed in a rural setting. Institutional discrimination and racism, lack of understanding or training, and the cultural taboos that exist all lead to the markedly different experiences of people of colour and other minority groups have when diagnosed with cancer. Their outcomes and quality of life, for that to really happen, we need the right data and to be listening better. Professor Sir Michael Marmot states in his recent report, there can be no more important task for those concerned with the health population than to reduce health inequalities. Review what can be done to reduce inequalities and then just do it. Social justice demands it. Before we meet our panel, I've asked Nafisa, Saima's sister, to say a few words. Welcome, Saima. Welcome, Nafisa. Um, she was diagnosed at the age of 29 with stage 4 lung cancer. And as the eldest of four sisters, Saima had stepped up at such a young age following our parents' divorce. And she always bore no trace of self-pity during her time navigating this diagnosis. She spent her time writing and speaking articulately, articulately on her experiences, which were raw, intimate and informative. And she also shared experiences that transcended her, rec her recent diagnosis, 
touching upon topics related to class, race, and gender too. In between her treatments, she organized supper clubs to raise funds for Trek stock, on which I helped along, alongside my sisters. And she spoke regularly on the need to break down taboo, taboo topics and misconceptions on living with cancer um, as a young woman of color. She set up the BAME Cancer Support Group, co-hosted a podcast on BBC Asian Network called Fresh to Death, and wrote thoughtfully for her blog entitled Curry and Cancer, and also for large publications such as Refinery29 and Vice. She wasn't afraid to challenge any cancer charity that engaged with her for the lack of research and statistics, which resulted in many being influenced to engage with the much needed data from minority communities. She had an incredible ability to instigate conversations, collaborations, and a sense of community through all areas of her world. Everyone who met her felt seen, listened to, and cultivated a sense of friendship, whether in person or through the online, through the online space. In her short but extraordinary life, Saima positioned herself as a trailblazing restaurateur in an industry where immigrant women chefs running independent restaurants had limited visibility. As a campaigner, she also paved the way for other minorities to break the silence on living with cancer. Her journey may have been cut short, but this event today is an example of how we can all continue this meaningful work. Thank you so much, Nafisa. Over the last year, we've reflected on the work we do, and Toril has been instrumental, challenging us to continue this journey. That's why we are delighted to partner with her to deliver this evening. Toril was herself diagnosed with breast cancer at 29, and again twice in her 40s. Toril was a friend of Saima, is the founder of Urban Kitchen, and an incredible activist who has tirelessly worked to ensure that the needs of all are heard. She's put together an amazing panel, and we are so grateful for her determination and passion to drive forward this conversation and to continue to hold Trekstock accountable as we do so. Over to you, Toril. So before I, ooh, it's very loud. Um, before I introduce you to my amazing panel, I just want to share kind of a little bit more about myself and why this work is so important. As Jemima shared, I had breast cancer at 29, and I've actually just had treatment this year in surgery. So I'm very much in the cancer world, but I'm also very much in the cancer world as a healthcare professional. I'm a nutritional scientist and functional medicine practitioner, and a big part of my job is to look after cancer patients, whether it's seeing them individually or helping with research research or giving nutrition talks all over the place, talking about the, the link between nutrition and cancer. But I'm very, very passionate about this particular topic, and I think it's something that's become very apparent over the last 20 months as we've gone through COVID, Black Lives Matters, and so on and so forth. So we're looking and we're moving towards personalized care in both cancer and in the UK. We now have the science for this. We're supposed to, as cancer patients, have holistic needs assessments and survivorship care plans, but I know from a conversation with Charlene that not all of us have that. Even I have not had a holistic needs assessment. So following a national drive for these things, how can we move to personalized care if we don't know who we're treating? And Stuart and I have had this conversation before. COVID-19 has shone a light on inequalities and highlighted the urgent need to manage health-related issues in deprived, marginalized, and ethnic communities. We need a cross-government and organization strategy for reducing health inequalities and the wider socioeconomic and structural inequalities that drive them as this leads to higher mortality. I'm always calling people out, and it's a hard, hard job, but I'm so passionate about this because I don't want people to needlessly die of cancer because they haven't had equal treatment. But what are inequalities? This is such a vast area, so I wanted to define these for you, even though this list is not exhaustive. So the type of cancer, some cancer gets a lot more funding and research than other types of cancer. Your age, four of us on the panel have had cancer at a young age, and that's actually been quite against us. Whether you've been treated rurally in an urban place, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, whether you're rich or poor, education, learning difficulties and sensory impairment and language, and whether you can see or whether you're deaf or whether you can hear. Such important things. 
Whilst we're still waiting for this year's latest census results, which are actually not going to be out until next year, but we do know that non-white groups account for approximately 15% of the population in England and Wales, and the largest ethnic groups are Indians, Pakistanis, Afro-Caribbeans, and Black Africans. Until recently, the ability to conduct high-quality health-related research with a focus on ethnicity has been limited in the UK. Although ethnicity has been recorded voluntarily in the hospital episode statistics since 1995, this is voluntary. And when I say voluntary, we'll come to this. And the quality and completeness of recording has been very variable, if at all. For LGBTQI groups, there's very little information recorded, and we will dig deeper into this. Comprehensive, good quality data is essential for enabling policymakers and healthcare professionals to create, identify the specific needs of different groups and respond with tailored strategies for addressing inequalities in cancer care. Lack of understanding and lack of data collection means support, awareness, and education needs of these communities are not being met, nor are care plans culturally sensitive. So I'm now going to introduce you to our amazing panel. I don't know if the people who are online are going to appear magically. Woohoo! <laughs> they are going to appear magically. So I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panel. I'm going to start with the people online because they may have missed us. So first of all, we have Dr. Georgette Oni. She is one of my heroes. She is an oncoplastic surgeon, and I've learned so much from her. And we'll, we'll do a little 30-second int introduction of why you're being in this panel. Georgette, can you hear? Yeah. I can hear. Yeah, hello. I think there's a little bit of a delay. Okay. 30 seconds of why you're invo involved in this, so agreed to be on my panel. Um, gosh. Um, whenever I might, if, if there's anything to do with inequalities and ways that we can improve it, ways we can address it, and I feel that I can do my little bit, I'm, you know, I'm absolutely happy to get involved. Uh, um, and I know Toral that you feel exactly the same way. You recently um, featured in uh, one of the conferences that I've held. Um, I think it's really important that we keep talking about these things. The more we talk about it, the more people are aware of it, the more people will do things about it, I hope. So I think every, every little bit um, will build on the next bit until hopefully we're, we're not going to be needing to do these things again, which would be quite nice, wouldn't it? Thank you. And Georgette was the founder of Black Women in Breast Cancer, and it's been an amazing global, actually, conference. And then we have Professor Edward Kanonga, who is a physiotherapist by training, but actually is a public health and epidemiology professor who talks a lot about these things. And I'm just very privileged to have him on behalf of the NHS and some of the public health bodies in the UK talking. So 30 seconds of why you're on our panel, Professor Kanonga. Yeah, thanks um, for the warm welcome and really looking forward to the session. Uh, I think we collect far too much data and use very little of it. We are data rich, information poor, and in some cases we don't have insights. So I'm hoping in the conversations we can talk about how we use even 20% of all the enormous data that we have uh, to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Next, we have Stuart, who is a young cancer patient, but is now the founder of Live Through This, an amazing cancer charity that supports the LGBTQI plus community, and an amazing lecturer and speaker. And I have enjoyed every single conversation we've had leading up to this panel. So, Stuart, 30 seconds. Uh, that kind of covers quite a lot of it, to be fair, but, but also I wanted to come and be part of this panel because I think when we talk about my career community, a lot of people don't realise we don't even collect the data, so we're almost one step further back, and I feel like our community is feasting on scraps trying to get some progress made, so it's important to get that into the public knowledge so we can hopefully make some progress. Then we have Dr. Adrian Milner, who's a personal friend, as well as being an amazing lecturer, academic researcher in race and ethnicity at Brunel University. Do you want to share your 30 seconds? Yes. So thank you so much for having me and tutorial and everyone who's put this on tonight. Inequalities are social justice issues, but they're also avoidable. They're unfair, and that means, though, that there's an answer to addressing them. So we can use data to actually not just make people's lives better, but to stop the inequalities and improve overall public health. Thank you. Then we have Brad, who is a good friend of Simon and mine, and he is part of the Trek Stock Young Adult Abasa community, the founder of Alike, all round kind of amazing person. Share a little bit more about why you're on this panel, other than I twisted your arm. No, not joking. <laughs> 
I mean, you don't need to twist my arm to speak on this, to be honest. I'll give me a microphone, I'll talk all night. <laughs> um, I think when all is said and done on this topic and reflecting on um, people's contributions so far, I think data and statistics are, have a stereotype of being really cold. But to us, they're people. And I think if statistics are missing, that means people are missing. And I think that's why it's really important to have this conversation. Thank you. And last but not least, but Charlene, who is a bone cancer survivor, cancer health coach, and actually one of my neighbours, we found out. So this is brilliant. We're going to be meeting for coffee very soon. So Charlene, 30 seconds on why you're being part of this panel. Um, thank you for inviting me, to be honest. Um, I love to get in involved in events like this, um, especially because I'm a survivor and not realising earlier along, along that I had a lot of, I faced a lot of cancer in a health inequalities and still is so um, I'm here because I facilitate a lot of support groups and just on behalf of my cancer community I'm here to just voice you know what's going on and just you know keep addressing and keep having this conversation hopefully something's going to be done. Thank you all so much for joining us. So we've kind of divided this into several parts. So we're going to dig further into the patient experience because so many of us are patients. And as Brad said, we are not numbers. We're actual people with lives and stories behind us. So we're going to dig deeper. So Stuart, your patient experience led you to realize there was a gap in training and education for staff treating LGBTQI patients. Can you share more about your experience and the light bulb moment for knowing that you had to tackle this problem and that was your purpose? Yeah, of course. And I think lifelong is a good point there because I'm a chronic cancer patient. So there's no sort of curative point for me. So uh, it's one of the things that I realized being a part of the system and being openly queer, because there's no way to code that in the system, there's no way to monitor it, that it has multiple impacts. One, as a burden on me, I have to come out every single time to a healthcare provider, I have to make that risk assessment, I have to basically see whether I think it's going to work in my favour, whether they're going to be understanding. There's also sometimes there's a lack of clinical knowledge of, for example, if I'm asking about PrEP, whether I can use that alongside chemo, and there's no knowledge because there's no data. And it really factors into the fact because we have no monitoring, there's no incidence data, there's no outcomes, and yeah, sometimes additional data that comes around as part of sort of patient experience, but the reality is, is as we talk about personalised care, how are we going to have personalised care if you're not getting to know me as a person from the first point? And if we really need to bring LGBT data on the same line as other inequalities so that we can push forward so people like myself aren't effectively lost in the middle between a healthcare sector that doesn't really respond well to you with the community that doesn't have the health information and knowledge because there's no research and you're pulling at straws just trying to find a narrative that you can pull into and try and feel seen and heard. And what made you think you're the one to change this? <laughs> um, I, I didn't, if, if I'm entirely honest. Uh, before this, I was a tattooer. I was living a very different life. And it was the people around me, because I decided I wanted to make a change, because I've always believed in activism and queer work and making sure that you can create futures that you see yourself in. Uh, and it was actually a Macmillan team around me that said, have you thought about turning this into a charity? Have you thought about seeing? And what I realized is there was an appetite for this work but there's no resource. So yeah. what they really need is they need someone from the community who can commit to it. And if I can't escape my cancer being incurable, I might as well lean into it. And I spent a good couple of years trying to lean away. And then I realized if I can lean in, then maybe I can help other people and try and get the system a little bit better so people will get more support as they come into it in the first instance. Thank you so much. Brad, you've had cancer twice, and the first time you're treated regionally in the north of England, and the second time you're in, treated in London at a kind of big teaching hospital. You noticed a real difference in your experience. What did you think was different, and how did this lead to you creating a like? I only really knew it was different in hindsight. Um, I was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia when I was 19, um, coming from a village in the heart of North Yorkshire, and then um, being put onto a maintenance treatment and then quickly moving down to London and then living my best life whilst I was here in the capital and volunteering for different organisations, joining the NHS Youth Forum and it was because of this experience meeting other young people that were not just impacted by cancer but with all sorts of different lived experiences um, that I started to really reflect and understand that the experience that I had being diagnosed with cancer in a local district, district general hospital and my treatment from um, um, a nurse in particular, which I believe there was a microaggression involved in that, um, started to really recognize, oh, my treatment and my experience wasn't great. And um, this 
started a journey for me working within the NHS and using lived experiences because ultimately lived experiences are the best resource in helping co-design and co-produce a system that works for people who are receiving the service. Patient participation is something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, but something that I noticed was around loneliness and isolation and the lack of visibility with certain communities, um, which is why I then created Alike. Um, I faced a, it wasn't technically a relapse, but it emotionally felt like a relapse. My um, original diagnosis, um, the maintenance treatment I was on, stopped, my body stopped responding to it, which meant that I had to be treated with a uh, bone marrow transplant. And it was this experience being treated at Hammersmith Hospital, so we're in a big urban centre, we're in a um, leukaemia centre of excellence. I had a fantastic professor of um, oncology and haematology treating me. Um, I got the book thrown at me when it came to services from other charities and from the NHS and just noticed such a huge disparity between that rural and urban setting when it came to accessing services, not just as a young person but then also as a, as a queer person as well um, and somebody from a, um, a northern deprived area. So that was really kind of like the foundation of my experience. Thank you, Brad. And Charlene, you had bone cancer, which is not one of the common cancers, and you were treated at a centre of excellence, but you've not felt supported or signposted to cancer services. What was missing for you? I think when I first got diagnosed in 2011, there wasn't any type of... Um, you know, we discussed this earlier about care plans. Apparently, we're meant to be getting a... You know, you're meant to be given a care plan... I don't actually remember being given a, clear plan, a care plan or knowing what's on this care plan. And just recently, just um, talking with my GP, they don't have a copy of this care plan, not to say it hasn't been done. So um, that was missing for me. Obviously, when you're going through the motions of cancer, me personally, I couldn't, um, I wasn't functioning. There was a few things missing. There was a lack of continuity with the, the nursing team, they kept changing. So in the end, my care just, you know, it, it, it literally dissolved. Um, I would say screening of recently, three years, I think, before COVID, you know, I had no screening. And this is a rare cancer, you know, that, you know, I'm meant to be seen at least once or twice a year. And... The follow-up recently, you know, it's it, again, it's gone downhill. So being exposed to groups like Black Women Rising and, you know, just hearing the health inequalities that's going on, you know, I, I didn't feel so isolated because, um, you know, just the lack, the lack of attention, support, you know, if I'd been signposted to amazing charities like Bone Cancer Research Trust, you know, that could, you know, just step in and actually tell me what was going to be happening to me at the time, then I think that would have made such a huge difference. Um, so, yeah, just things like the signposting for me was just, it's key. It's definitely key. I wish I'd signpost these track stop because you are one of the young people that we could have supported here at this charity and there's so much information that we could share. And thank you so much for sharing. So just for people listening who don't know nor about cancer care, we are often assigned a sort of a cancer nurse who kind of talks us through maybe um, not just the kind of treatment process, but maybe some of the other things, the softer things that signpost us to different things. I mean, I go to my nurse about all sorts of things. I'm not even going to share the latest conversations because they were in the other, the, the last panel that we did for Trek Stop. But, you know, there's definitely things that you want to be signposted at. And so if you don't have that support, it feels very lonely. And also you just don't know what's going on. And I think that's really important. Um, oh, I feel like I've got some. So we want to dig deeper into the data, and I'm actually going to read something um, out. We asked um, NHS Health Inequalities to share where they're at currently with data collection. We have invited someone to come on board, but they were this month is actually um, Health Inequalities Month, and they're doing a lot of talking all over the country, especially with GPs. There's a core survey that's out at the moment, which is available for people to answer who are healthcare professionals until the 19th of the month. Um, 
and if you just Google it, you'll find it. But I just wanted to share some of the data, and we really focus on ethnicity and the LGBTQI experience because that's what they gave us. So ethnicity data is collected as part of initial cancer registration as well as through hospital visits via the hospital episode statistics collection. HES data is fed into existing cancer data sets to improve data completeness. Data relating to operational performance, cancer service use, and cancer outcomes is then analyzed and shared with regional teams and cancer alliances, which can include breakdowns by ethnicity, which can, by the way. Um, this data is shared through ad hoc and routine publications to help inform the planning and delivery of cancer services locally. Some of the most recent and relevant published data includes monthly COVID-19 cancer equity packs, the cancer Na National Cancer Registration Analysis Service, roots diagnosis by ethnicity, tumor type, and other patient characteristics, and then in 2018, NCRAS short report on variation of cancer incidence by ethnicity across London in 2015. Patient characteristic data, including ethnicity, is also collected as part of the Cancer Patient Experience Survey and Cancer Quality of Life Survey. Has anyone who's had cancer been asked to fill out this survey? I've never had a CPS. I've never seen one. Never no, had anyone seen one? You've had one. You've had one. Okay, good. good. Just yeah. one person out of four. Okay, 25%. Great. Yeah. These surveys collect data on patient experience and quality of life the results of which are used to better understand how services can be improved to support the needs of cancer patients in the future. The NHS program is also working to improve representation within the surveys to more accurately describe the experiences of cancer patients from all backgrounds. The NHS cancer program's Cancer Data Alliance's Data Evaluation and Analysis Service has been deriving new cancer inequality data from across the patient pathway, which it shares with cancer alliances and regional teams. This work has been supported by the health inequality experts and data colleagues. Um, I'm not going to share the example because it's quite specific, but they're looking to expand this to compare early stage across patient ethnicity. And the, N the Nash NHS cancer program is also working to Im Im explore improving the availability of cancer survival data, including breakdowns by ethnicity. This data will be better used to better inform the planning and delivery of cancer services, both nationally and locally. And then we come to the LGBTQI information. The NHS cancer program is working closely with NHS England Improvement Health Inequalities team to better understand and obtain access to relevant data sources that include information on patient characteristic data such as sexual orientation and gender. I would say gender identity. This includes primary care data which in contains patient characteristic information that is not routinely collected elsewhere. This data will be used by the cancer program to support the identification of cancer patient inequalities and that are not seen in the current data available. And then the last point, which I thought was very interesting, was sexual orientation data is currently collected through the annual population survey where this data has previously highlighted that lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals are more likely to be cigarette smokers compared to heterosexual individuals, with smoking being the biggest risk factor for cancer. So, I do have lots of questions. I'm just going to come back to those. I'm going to regroup. Um, so, just kind of, when I'm thinking about this, I'm wondering what data should be collected and how. Not all black cancer patients or Asian cancer patients are the same. For example, the prevalence of cancer differs in subgroups, whether it's Bangladeshi and Pakistani. Who decides how care is de delivered? How much of the needs of different communities are left out of the equation and narrative of cancer care? So, for example, there's very little for trans community. Current data collection is what we just shared. So, I've got some questions. Oh, these are... I'm going to switch them around if that's okay. Um, Stuart, in your role, um, first of all, can you explain the difference between data collection and monitoring? Because I think that's really important. Yeah, there is a good difference there. So basically what the NHS were responding to for you there was they were talking about survey data, which is data after the effect, and it's a lot of patient experience stuff. So they were explicitly referring to the GP patient survey. Um, where they actually routinely now look at LGB data and they included the trans status monitoring question for the first time last year. They finally are putting the it in the NCPES, which is going out this year, although the last NCPES data was only done by local trusts uh, because there was a lack of uptake because of COVID. And because of that, they did, you can actually still break it down by ethnicity, but they removed LGB data. Oh. So, so, so what you see is effectively what they're saying to you is, oh, we're collecting some data after the fact. But what then you get from that is you get inference, you don't get incidence. Mm. So what you're getting is, okay, so we know there are these 
certain behaviors, or we know there's some risk behaviors, or we know there's some sort of things that align, but what we're not actually getting is, this is the patient that identifies in this way, this is them in the cancer registry, this is how many people are affected in this way. And also, when they talked about that national surveys with gave us the smoking data, there was no trans status monitoring in there. So we're still fighting just to be seen in these data sets, and Brad made the good point that that's visibility. In the healthcare system, if you're not a data point, you don't exist. No. So if you're a trans person, for example, and you're going through this system, this also impacts things like screening access. Are you actually able to in be invited to screening? Or will, the, for example, with people who go for cervical screening, if they're a trans man, quite often when their sample is sent to the lab, the lab will just refuse it because it has a male mark on it. Because in my view, the NHS records are not fit for purpose. They categorize everything into just sex, which is male and female. And we know that's not true either because they have intersex variations. Yeah. But they just put it in that way. And also what we don't have is we don't have a gender category. So we just assume everything is inferred by that. So when someone does transition and change their gender mark on their records, they're actually changing their sex marker. And that creates loads of interpersonal and system-based issues. And then also what's happening, because we don't have a way to monitor these people in the system, is we're basically just expecting people to either write additional notes on the record, it might get lost, it might be lost between departments. And really, the only place that data is recorded well is in sexual health or the GIC, so the gender identity clinics. But they're ring-fenced, their data isn't shared. So I keep pushing and asking, like, when can we have this data in the cancer registries? When can we actually find out about incidents and risk and impact in the same way we can for some other data sets? And I think, you know, one of the things that I'm very aware of, and we've discussed, I know that guy, you know, um, one of your colleagues has talked about this beautifully, is about people, if you have a prostate, it doesn't matter what gender identity or sex you are, you just need to check it. If you have any breast tissue, you need to have that checked. If you have any, cerv any kind of cervix at some point, you need to have that checked because the, the incidence of cancer is not, not changed, it's still there. And, well, and it's also the fact that, and because it goes into this factor of, for example, if someone is on cross-sex hormones, and then when we try and figure out if there's any potential incidence risk or increase, or if there's any you know, additional impact in that relation to cancer, what we're actually having to do is look at data from other countries, because they get the data better than we do, or we're looking at a very small sample set. And then when we take that forwards and we try and get some kind of institutional change or some kind of improvement inside our own healthcare system, we're told there's not enough data. So we're caught in this catch-22 where if the NHS isn't getting the data primarily, and I get told this when I go to GPs and I'm teaching them their own system to support trans people, and they always ask me, okay, well, if we do these things, how can we see if it's made an impact? And I have to remind them, you don't collect the baseline. Yeah. You don't know who's coming in, so how can I show you the improvement? You have to make that first step. You have to improve your monitoring and your records management to help patients on their pathways. And uh, when I've questioned people, so I'll give you an example. I had radiotherapy um, earlier this year, and I am a person of color, but I'm a light-skinned person of color. And um, one of the bits of advice that was given to me is that if you burn, you'll, you'll have burns within the first week. Nothing happened for the first week. I was like, amazing, great, nothing happened. And then literally, I think day 13, my skin started to fall off. And it was just before Easter, and I was like, oh my God, what do I do? And I did get some help eventually, but my, the question I asked when the the... Because my nurse was away, my radiotherapy nurse, specialist nurse. But when she returned, I said to her, have you ever collected data? Have you asked anybody? Because essentially, radiotherapy burns are sun sunburns on, on speed. And so, you know, people of color, because of our melanin, we're going to have burns at a later stage, and they're going to present differently. So unless you collect data, and she was like, anecdotally, I've heard this, and actually I've kind of seen it, and I spoke to my breast cancer nurse, it was also a woman of color, and she said the same thing, but yet nothing was happening, and I'm in a center of excellence. So this is a practical example of why we need to know who we're treating, because the advice needs to be personalized for them. And if I wasn't uh, you know, in the medical world, and I didn't have the support, because with COVID, you know, this is in the lockdown period, I would have really struggled. So that's just to give an example, but we're going to continue with the, with the questions now. So, um, ooh, Adrian, we're going to come to you. I'm going to lose your question. Wait, hold on, it's coming back. Here we go. Sorry about that. It's wrong order. So your work specializes in racism in the UK healthcare, both within the healthcare professionals and patients, and some of the work you do supports NHS. Given a statistical background, why do we need data from marginalized groups to create change? So... Aside from the data from marginalized groups specifically, we need data on racism because race and ethnicity does not cause racial disparities. Racism causes the disparities. So we need information and no data is collected in the NHS on racial attitudes of clinicians. 
because they are the decision makers. They are the ones who treat people. They are the ones who people might not even present at a clinic or for screening if they have had an experience of discrimination or they feel that they will be treated differently. Um, so I think the data that's completely absent is data on homophobic attitudes, racist attitudes, sexist attitudes of clinicians because that is where the disparities happen. So we can collect all sorts of data that's really important, but if we get it at the smallest scale, that's better. So some, sometimes the ONS, you know, if you are a black British person, you have to choose, oh, I'm black African or I'm black Caribbean. You can't, even if you were born here and you're British, the way the data is collected, you cannot say you're Asian, British, black, British, whatever. For me, I'm like other white. I don't, I don't know what that is, okay? Like, that's not helpful, right? So when we see the data that's collected, and, and, you know, our other speaker is absolutely correct. We have all this data, but it's not used properly. A lot of the data that we have, though, is collated in such a way that it's not, it's, it's not useful, and that's why it's, it's one of the reasons it's not being used. But we also need data to hit the NHS where it hurts, and that's in the actual attitudes of the people who are working, because that is where the disparities are caused. Thank you. And there's so much we could say, and we will continue this conversation. Georgette, as an oncoplastic surgeon, someone's creating national change. What data would you like to see collected, and how do you think this would make a difference to patient care? Gosh, that's quite a big question, isn't it? Um, we've already heard that we collect a lot, a lot, a lot of data. Um, and uh, honestly, I, I think it's really, really difficult um, because it's a two-way thing. You can have as many data sets as you like, but you need to populate them and then you need to analyze them. Um, so I, I think that there, there has to be an element of people engaging into the system in the first place to volunteer that data. And in order for them to do that, they need to feel that they are um, it, it's going to be in a safe, non-judgmental um, manner in which is not going to negatively impact um, on their outcome. Um, so it, it, it is difficult whenever I see, I mean, I, you know, you read research papers, you read reports, and then you look down at the breakdowns of things and you think, oh my gosh, they had like, what, three people that were not white or whatever, it, you know, you know, in the numbers. Um, and then you think, well, actually, how do you extrapolate that then against a, you know, a, a huge multi, um, ethnic population I you know we're all kind of waiting with interest to see what the, the next census shows in terms of, of breakdown um but the, the fact is, is that it then starts to have like a, a it has a real world effect and we're we are thinking that one size fits all but clearly it isn't um and the discussion around personalized medicine I think from our perspective we're looking at it in a really kind of clinical genetic kind of way so if you fit this kind of category then that is the personalized medicine that you that um is for you um and from what I'm getting from this panel it's almost like the reverse it's like what is it person to me as an individual which is I think it is a completely different uh, different discussion um and it it does involve um, it sounds a bit sort of pomp, but the sanctity of the relationship between the healthcare practitioner, uh, the provider, and the person that's on, going to be on the receiving end of that care. It's about that relationship. And as Adrian said, it just really takes one negative interaction to really set the tone of what's going to happen that, that, you know, hence forth. So, yeah, research into attitudes, not just on the side of the patient. I mean, there's lots of sort of patient experience type, you know, research out there, lots of qualitative research to that effect. A bit harder to collect data and what it's like when you're the care giver, you know, the care provider um, and what the attitudes are there. But watch this space because we are planning to try and do some. Thank you, Georgia. Now, Professor Kanonga, you did say that there's a lot of data. So I'm going to change my question to you. As part of the NHS Health Inequalities team, my question to you was going to be, how near are we to having systems analysis in place for comprehensive and compulsory data? But I'm going to change that slightly and ask what systems analysis we have placed to actually deal with the amount of data we have and actually make it useful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's already been uh, touched on by uh, by colleagues, the, the frustration of having to repeat your story so many times uh, and yet nothing is done about your experience or your specific uh, issues that relate to you as an individual. Uh, and it's already been talked about in terms of personalized care. And I think the health care system 
is many, many years behind all the other sectors. I mean, if you want to renew your passport these days, you can do it online. Uh, they can link the picture you had taken in a photo booth with the application, and you don't even need to send some of these things. But when it comes to healthcare, some of the data we hold is still in paper-based um, files. So you've got a massive file that sits somewhere in the system. Uh, and if that gets lost, then that's all of your data lost. Uh, or if another healthcare professional involved in your care wants access, then there can be delay in transporting your records. So I think that there is a lot, uh, if, if we really want to aspire to personalized care, there is a lot we need to do around making that information available when it is required. Uh, and and I'll, I'll push this a bit further to say personalized care, absolutely. But let's also talk about precision medicine. How do we ensure that we are as precise as is required? And I'm not talking about being precise and treating every patient differently, but let's understand the unique differences uh, that might affect outcomes and let's be precise in how we handle that, how we collect that data and how we use that information for delivering care. Then uh, above that, then it's the, how do we understand cohorts of patients with similar needs? So we start to build the picture uh, of uh, cohorts of different patients and go beyond the anecdotes uh, to really get to understand the distribution uh, of some of the issues, uh, the care pathways that we're delivering, are we achieving outcomes for everyone? Do we have people who are underserved? What is the stage of presentation? What are some of the reasons behind that? So we, we are doing uh, a, an ambitious program within the NHS called Population Health Management, which is about bringing together all the different pieces of the jigsaws. Uh, and really aligning them so that we begin to understand the intersection between patient preferences, between their social context, and what happens when they come into our care. On top of that, it's how we build on things like electronic patient records. We know that bits and parts of your care sit in different systems. So you've got your lab results, you've got your blood results sitting elsewhere, You've got your outcomes from your outpatient appointment. You've got your GP, all sitting separately. And I think electronic patient records, if they deliver what they should do, they should enable all of that to be held on a platform that draws out that information and makes it available to inform clinical decision making. And then from that, we can then build up the population health management principles and begin to understand cohorts of patients who is underserved, who is not receiving the care that they should receive, and how do we ensure uh, that we target those individuals with interventions? Then we're also very keen on understanding there's already been talk about the care you receive should not depend on where you live. This is the NHS. The N is national. Mm -hmm. So it means that we need to be able to access and to offer services to individuals. That's not to say have a specialist in every hospital, but we need to map out the data on which capabilities do we have at which parts of the system and how do we make sure that uh, we can link patients and care pathways so that there's ready access and we eliminate unnecessary delays, uh, which we know sometimes uh, can cost lives. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of some of the work that we are doing, both in terms of driving precision medicine, but also in terms of amalgamating that to help us to understand cohorts of patients and above all to improve care and outcomes. Thank you so much. And I know as a professor of epidemiology, you are looking at those cohorts to understand what can help our health as a nation, because that's ultimately the most important thing, and which is why we're having this conversation. So we're going to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this um, personalized care and you know, where we think healthcare professionals can make a difference. Brad, in your role as an NHS youth expert, how do you think collecting data might improve care? It's such a big topic. Um, I think, firstly, the NHS is a very, very confusing system from a user perspective, let's say. Um, and we have to remember that we are dealing with the largest single unitary healthcare system in the world. Um, 1.4 million people employed. 
which means that it is a huge system to navigate, both for the people that it's employed by and also for the user. Um, I do think integrated care systems are going to go a long way in helping that and putting patients um, in the center. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction. It doesn't solve everything, but it does go in the right direction. Um, I think there's much better patient participation within the NHS, but I think the approach has to be, um, has to kind of be the same coin. So one side is quantitative, um, the, the quantitative data and the data collection, which we know is lacking. Tonight is an example of that. It's great in some areas and lacking in other areas with visibility. But as members of the cancer community, we know there is an abundance of qualitative research, stories, and that's all you have to do is speak to patients to understand that there are so many problems. So when it comes to data, it's not just quantitative, it's qualitative. And we need to, we need a much better heart and mind approach. A lot of NHS senior leaders respond to data on, in the quantitative sense of this is what the data tells me, but we know it's lacking. So they're making decisions based on evidence and data which has holes in it. We need to respond much much more to stories and lived experience because as i'm sure people with lived experience in this room and people watching online will know that when you experience something and you've experienced within a healthcare setting whatever that experience may be you you, you think you were unique in that experience and then you you sit with it but then you speak to a friend of somebody with lived experience you speak to a professional and they go as you said oh somebody else has experienced that and that's a problem you then speak to somebody else. And this was my experience being a member of the NHS Youth Forum. It's like, it's not just a problem in my locality, it's a problem everywhere. And that's that transference from qualitative to then being quantitative. I spoke to thousands of people and they've had this issue. Is that not quali uh, quantitative data in itself? Um, so I, d I think there's a bit of a, um, there's some people that do patient participation really, really well and, and they do it in an excellent fashion. And there's other people that think it's just a nice to have. And when you approach people try, to try and engage senior leaders with participation, they can be some, sometimes be quite dismissive. And I think it's this culture change of how we value patients. I hope that answers your question. It's such a huge thing. There's so many thoughts. I've got chemo brain today as well. It's, there's so many thoughts going around in my head. Um, but I think that's the main thing. It's that we've, we've kind of got the, the hearts down in the storytelling. We just, we just need people to listen. But then we also need to make sure that whatever data we are collecting is being used in the, in the best way. And I think that's basically, as a more integrative and holistic healthcare professional, I think that's all over the place. So whether it's, you know, are we, okay, we're giving them the drugs, but are we giving them the nutrition and diet, cultural advice, you know, all of those things all over the place. So I think I love the way you describe that. With, we have the heart in the stories and we have the data and the people, but it, it has to all fit together. And that's what integrative health to me means, where it's inclusive, it's uh, listening, it's hearing, it's giving people personalized care. And I think cancer organizations and healthcare professionals and hospitals, and, you know, we all need to look at that. I think you were going to say something, sorry. I was just going to add in, I was just going to add in that um, I think something else that we have to be very cog cognizant of is that there is amongst vulnerable and marginalized communities a profound distrust of institutions. So even if there is an opportunity to fill in a research piece, whether it be a survey, whether it be taking part in a clinical trial, we saw this with the transference of um, data from NHS trusts to the regional one. The Secretary of State at the time was pushing people to do it. There is a, and, and even though I'm quite trusting of institutions, believe it or not, um, I know there's people that I've worked with that, that don't have that trust. So it's about building that relationship again, that you won't get people act taking part within the healthcare system unless you build that trust with these communities. Now that's a really important point and thank you for sharing that. Georgette, as a fan of Black Women and Breast Cancer Conference, what are the main issues that you see which are impacted by inequalities in cancer care? And I know you've had some phenomenal speakers over the last three years discussing this. So uh, I started uh, the conference because of the data that was coming out, essentially, which basically showed that black women were doing a lot worse than their white counterparts in terms of their breast cancer outcomes. Um, and so really, for me, it was, a, it was just a question of, you know, can we start to um, address some of that, maybe just raise awareness, um, you know, try and find out what the kind of the issues were, 
um, with, with engagement or is it engagement at all? Is it, like I say, is it the relationship between healthcare provider, um, you know, and the patient? And as Brad has just said that, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of distrust and sometimes it does mean that you've got to be a little bit more patient and patient in that consultation with your patient so that, you know, you can really sort of try and sort of build that rapport and try and figure out what, what the issues are. But all of these things take, take time um and you know i think one thing that we've not really said it is the amount of pressure that the nhs is under um and that the fact that we have to deliver a lot of care to a lot of people you know under a lot of sort of financial and time constraints and people constraint you know we don't the manpower the people power um for the nhs many many services at the moment are, you know are like uh, you know buckling under pressure the, the pandemic on top of everything else and you know we've certainly seen that in the you know in in our own unit um and the amount of you know the extra amount of time that people are really putting in to try and keep services running so, you know, just as the person sitting across the way from you in the consultation is human, so are the people providing um, care also. So I think, it, you know, you know I, I completely sort of support the point that Brad was making about the terms of the way that we can rebuild that relationship on both sides. Um, so part of that, the, the um, feel, you know, the sort of driving ethos behind the conference was to start to show that there are many faces, you know, in cancer care that do really genuinely care. And it, you know, it wasn't, you know, I had people from lots of different backgrounds actually speaking, you know, the, the latest conference, I had the, the CEO of Breast Cancer Now, um, she's spoken, a lot of my colleagues, not necessarily black or Asian, minority ethnic, just people that are genuinely interested in improving outcomes um, have all come on board and helped um, with the conference organising speaking. So I think there is a sort of, there's a genuine desire out there to level that kind of the, the disparities, but Sometimes it does feel like it's all very insurmountable. And so um, that's why, you know, things like this are actually really, really good events because, you know, they're, you know, they're bespoke. They, they, you know, they try and draw in um, people just to try and start to understand some of the issues. Uh, because, as I always say, you can have as many data or as treatments, et cetera, as you want. But if people don't engage or people don't feel safe to engage, then, you know, we're not going to get any change in outcomes. Um, so, so yeah, I, you know, I, I always feel that yes, okay, if one or two women, um, it changes kind of their their outlook or the way that they engage with a treatment plan, for instance, then you know the conference has done what it what it was set out to do. Thank you so much. And I, I don't have the figures to hand, but uh, for the last National Cancer Patient Experience Survey, I think there was something like 27,000 um, people who responded, but I think only 400 and something were people, black people, is that right? Yeah, sorry. So just to point out that we're not engaging, some communities are not engaging with this information either. So that's important too. And that's part of the trust that Brad was talking about. So Stuart, Really coming back to the lack of data collection means that some marginalised groups, particularly the trans community and intersex people, are not being cared for at all because they're not even visible. They don't even have records. So can you just dig a little bit deeper and share more so we can understand more about this and what you think we could do going forward? Yeah, um, I think Brad definitely touched on a really good point about faith in the system. So a lot of people are very afraid to come out because they fear poorer care. Um, there's been people who we've heard of who were had a bad rapport with their surgeon and they were afraid that some cancer would be left inside them on purpose. And these are very real fears people have. So we have to acknowledge those. Like Brad said, these are real people's stories. And yes, we have data points, but we have to back them up with stories. But then, unfortunately, because we don't get monitored in the system, we end up only relying on our stories. That's all we have. And stories mm. aren't interesting to commissioners. They aren't interesting to people who run organizations. So we're basically trying to push forward with this qualitative data, but we need it backed up. Because otherwise, we're stuck in this sort of in-between where, for example, the use screen self-sample pilot in Northeast London for people to self-sample for HPV, when that went forward, it was written in a very simple system, which was basically based on the standard PL list and inviting people in non-responders to cervical screening. And when we questioned on them, well, is it trans-inclusive? Their whole point was like, well, yeah, because the system's trans-inclusive. No, it's not. That's the whole reason why it needs to be changed. That's why the opt-in change is coming. But it's this blind spot people have because they don't have the experience, they're not engaging with the community, and then we're left without the data. And then I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done from the NHS point of view to appreciate that it has had a lack of data for a very long time. Even if we look at sexual orientation, in 2017, the NHS released a sexual orientation monitoring standard, and they just haven't implemented it. 
So it's been so long, and I asked Amanda, the new chief exec of the NHS, why? You know, and I'm waiting for that response because it's important to us. And if there is no answer after five years of waiting, it can't just slip your mind for that long. And if it does slip your mind for that long, what does that do to the implicit bias of everybody in that system treating those patients? I think as well, for my generation, we grew up under Section 28, where the government literally told us we weren't allowed to mention being queer. So think about what that does to a person's mind when they're going to healthcare, and then we're placing additional burden on those patients to tell us they're queer because we don't put it in the system, and we expect them to do that with every clinician, every interaction, and to think that that's worth it when we spent our whole childhood saying, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So there's a real power imbalance here. So this is why the system has to change, but also the attitudes, like we're saying with clinicians, they really have to understand they have a part to play in this. And we all have implicit bias, but when we go to work, we have to overcome that and put patients' needs first. And there's some people doing it really well and some people are unfortunately not doing it quite so well. And just like every other organization in the Western world, there is so many, there's so much bias. And, and I, I personally, I wonder, and we'll come on to this with Adrian in a minute, but for me, it's like, you have to be responsible as a person to go and do the work. And what I'm noticing is that, and this is kind of going off point, but not really. white men are not doing the work. And I'm having to constantly remind them that, for me, becomes exhausting and a bit of a microaggression. And when I'm bringing these things up about different communities, it's not always about, it's about really about different communities. People feel very defensive. And the conversation now, and some of the people, the organizations that I was talking to about this before last May and June, who are so defensive about it, and now they're, and in the middle, they were a bit defensive, and now they're like, oh, we realize, but they're still not willing to own their own bias and do the work on their own bias, and I think this is where we all, it doesn't matter what profession you work in, you have to work it, because we're people, we're humans, us, humans are flawed, we are flawed, but we have to work on our flaws. So that brings you to it. So go well, on. I just want to add a quick extra thing as well, because you mentioned a really good point about microaggressions. I think Brad mentioned it earlier as well. Microaggressions are very hard to point out when you're the minority, right? And you're pushing upwards against the person who's in a position of power, usually a white man. And I think it's quite telling the fact that the Equality Act is supposed to support people with this so that they can access healthcare services and all services and be protected by law. And in, in that, we have sexual orientation and gender identity, transgender people. So we know it should be protected in the Equality Act. Why is it not being monitored and supported inside the NHS and all healthcare systems? And, and yeah, and I think that's one of the things that, I mean, going on to Adrian, um, as a lecturer in the topic of racism and inequalities, what do you say to students to help them to examine their own bias and how does this extrapolate to healthcare professionals and cancer organizations? So I think the first thing is that color blindness is not the goal, okay? So if you were like me, we all grew up that this was the ideal, is color blindness. And it can never be the ideal because we grow up in a white supremacy. So the first thing is that, you know, saying I'm not racist, right, the goal is anti-racism first off, and that you have to continuously learn and continuously act. You don't go to the BLM march and then you get your badge and like, that's it, you're anti-racism forever, okay? So I think the whole point is recognizing that we all have biases, even if we are a person of color or we are in a part of the LGBT community, um, we, were still t we were still raised under homophobia, we were still raised under transphobia, we were still raised in a white supremacy. So I think it's a constant process of examining oneself, examining one's treatment, and it's also questioning the way that the system is geared to privilege white people. So with COVID, no one is saying white people are protected against COVID. Everyone's saying, oh, there's racial disparities, there's, there's worse outcomes for black people, for Asian people, whatever. No one's saying, look, white people are protected, white people are privileged, white people get to live or are, are not losing their family members, and, and this is even privileging them more when they go out in the workforce and creating even more resources, and it's a cycle of health and inequality or health and privilege. So I think that's the goal in, for health professionals as well. Again, I think in the British population specifically, and in British healthcare specifically, um, even what you were just saying, Stuart, about you've been told not to talk about race. This is the same thing. Uh, um, this is, you've been, you've been conditioned not to talk about race, and this goes down to medical schools. Because guess who runs our medical schools? White people. If you look at every single medical school, and we've just done the study in the UK, you look at the deans, you look at the presidents, you look at the vice chancellors, they are white. And we should do this with LGBT yes. people and disabled people Let's and stuff, but, but we just look at their pictures, so we'll have to ask them, but. 
But just kind of continuing on that from that conversation, and that means if you look at textbooks for, and I went to medical school, yeah, they're all very much pictures of white people. If you look at dermatology, our skin is different. We need pictures of different things look different. For example, I am very prone to keloid scarring because I have more melanin in my skin. Do, do people know about it and talk about it? And I think that's one of those things that becomes really important. And, you know, we know that more people of color are at the front line in our amazing NHS. So don't, we're not pointing a finger, by the way. This is very much what I appreciate. It's just that where things need to change. Brad, I think you wanted to say something. I think it's, it's what seems to be missing in the dialogue is, um, and, and, and Stuart touched upon this, is lack of intersectionality within this, within this dialogue. And I think that's, that's it. When you when you take a person and you add a protected characteristic to them, they go further and further down the scale of importance to the system. Um, and, and so you have to flip it on its head. If you make the system work for someone who is black, trans, um, with can impacted by cancer from a low socioeconomic background, if you make it work for them, it works for everybody else. Um, and I think that's, that's what we need to be doing because as I said to you in, in the call, the act of filling in the survey is a tick box exercise and we don't like tick box exercises. And I know that obviously you have to fill in the survey, um, but I think it comes down to how, how do you fill it in? What do you do um, when you are filling in that survey? Um, so it's, it's a system change, right? Sorry, Adrian, do you mind explaining intersectionality for the people who might not know what that is? I know sure. some of us do. Sorry, I just <laughs> realized it might be something really important to touch on. Okay, so intersectionality um, goes back to black feminists in the United States. You can even be traced back to Sojourner Truth in the late 1800s when she um, gave her um, Ain't I a Woman speech. So it's, it was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw um, in terms of a legal definition of the intersection of race times gender. So it's just the idea that you're not just your race and your gender and your age and your ability or disability. You're all these things together and these things all interconnect to form your everyday experience. That also is important, not just in your own personal experience, but in the systems that you interact with on a daily basis. So the legal system, the education system, um, business, sport, everything, um, we have these, these intersecting identities where we all hold various identities that are simultaneous, privileged and disadvantaged, and it, it just depends on what situation you're in. So Charlene, that brings me to ask, what does it feel like to know that you might not have had the same treatment in cancer care as a black woman as opposed to being a white, cisgender, heteronormative woman? It's demoralizing. Um, you know, it's unhuman. You, you know, you're going through one of the worst periods of your life, and not only are you going through this, you know, you're being, um, what's the word? Um, you're being left out, you know? You're not being included. And, you know, the work that I do, I hear it all the time, you know, black women not able to get wigs, and that's a huge thing in what I do, you know, and you just can't believe in this day and age, you know, a cancer patient's going out, a black woman going out buying her own wig. And, you know, it's, I, I don't know what to say, it's just, it's, it's really disheartening and I just can't believe this is going on and on and on and it's like, when is this going to change? You know, but I, you know, thank you Toro and Trekstock for actually having this conversation because there's there's so much work that needs to be done honestly and i think just you mentioned wigs but in cancer care it's not just wigs it's lymphedemia sleeves even just exactly. plasters the plasters that you can buy in the yeah. uk are all for white people <laughs> and like the acupuncture studs that i get luckily i'm quite you know it's okay but like there's lots of things it's not just as you said the wigs but also why are we not why are those things not being provided go ahead sorry and just touching on what you said my keloid scar you know, it's, it's a huge part of my appearance and my identity after I had my um, operation. And this wasn't explained to me. Nothing was explained to me in terms of the way it's going to look and feel. And, you know, and again, you know, it just keeps happening. Have you had any care to look, personalised care to look after that keloid scar since? Have you asked for that? Or is it something you've just thought, no one's giving this to me? No one's giving this to me. No one's talking about it as well. 
So know? again, we need dermatologists yeah. and surgeons to, uh, and I know Georgette here is phenomenal, by the way, um, and <laughs> you know, to understand that you know, if people end up with keloid scars, that they need to be able to, and there are things that you can do, and I'm constantly showing any surgeon my belly button because I have a new belly button. Like, what can I do about it? And literally, I did that on Saturday. It was very funny. Mm -hmm. But um, I want to round, oh, sorry, Brad, one last one. Just to build upon that, though, like there's, um, there's so many examples, sadly. Um, medical devices, for example. Now, I don't know how, if this was anecdotal, but I remember reading the device that's used to um, uh, measure oxygen in your blood on your finger yeah. Yeah. doesn't respond to people with high levels of mel melanin in the skin. Yeah. Um, it's built for white people, right? Uh, so there's so many examples of, of, of this institutional racism, I think, which is, which is sad, but I think it's exposing it when you know there's a problem, it's about exposing a problem, and the first step is admitting that there is one, because then you can fix it. And then I just want to add one thing to that, if that's okay. Sorry, we keep no, no, ruining no, your great. timing. But also, I think it's also important to think about the way that this impacts directly on care and people, but then also when we're thinking about data, we keep talking about these surveys, especially for our community, that's all we have. But again, these surveys are built by white people. It's not taking into account people's differences in their communities, their impacts, their identities. So it's very surface level data that would affect effectively white men and it's not capturing a full experience. And especially when they're saying to us, oh, but your community has this data, we've done this survey. Well, it's, not the, it's not the data we need. We need more. And, and extrapolating and that, not just survey. So if you think about um, cancer organizations and the resources they give for diet or the information they give is it in different language i know one or yeah. two can't say you know, in brilliantly but uh, most just have it in english so that means yeah. you're excluding a massive part of this community and, um, and with that in mind as well when i think about it from an lgbt's perspective a lot of our work that happens for us this inclusion work is a bolt-on so it happens as an additional content that gets slapped on the side and what happens because it's not in core content if then that charity organization goes back and they decide to translate all their core content we get left behind yeah. So, what, so what happens to that person who's trans and their ESL, their English second language? How do they get the information that's right for them? Do they have to, again, break apart their intersectional identity and then they're trans in one space and black in another? Yeah, and I think that's really important. And I think, you know, going back to kind of the points that you're making is that owning it. And if our government isn't owning that there's institutional systemic racism in this country, it's a problem. But we're not going to go down there. <laughs> we're going to go to Professor Konongo for the last word on this conversation before we open it up to questions. So as a healthcare professional, Professor Konongo, as a part of the NHS inequality team, as a professor of... Uh, epidemiology and public health, and obviously this is so important to everything you do, what advice do you offer both cancer organizations and healthcare professionals to tackle this? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think the work you are already doing is, is fantastic. Uh, being the voice of uh, those who feel disempowered uh, and, and really advocating and lobbying for change. So uh, keep up the good work that you are uh, already doing. Uh, I mean, I think that there is a lot that COVID-19 pandemic has exposed uh, and increased our understanding. So, so we have known uh, for a long time that uh, ignore what disease it is, those people who are marginalized, those people who are vulnerable, before they have whatever condition it is, when they get it, they get left behind. Whether it is cardiovascular disease, or in this case, cancer uh, or COVID-19. The way the pandemic rolled out in our communities was very predictable and preventable as well. And, and I think when you look at health inequalities, regardless of where you look, the inequalities just stare at you back as if to say, what are you going to do about it? Whether you look at cancers in young people, whether you look at maternal outcomes, whether you look at cardiovascular disease, that just shows you that it is systemic. It is not just a happenstance that, oh, well, it just happens in young cancer patients, but it doesn't happen elsewhere. So it requires a systemic solution. Uh, and I think organizations like yourselves really need to continue with that advocacy to make sure that uh, those of us who work in public service uh, really take on board uh, and we don't leave communities behind. Then there's all the fantastic work that you do uh, on prevention, where there are preventable risk factors. The work that you do on promoting early diagnosis, supporting people as they begin their journey on treatment, palliation, bereavement, uh, and all the way to supporting uh, people who have lost their loved ones. 
uh, I, I think it's it's you are unsung heroes and please carry on that good work and continue to challenge us to make sure that we get it right uh, for the patients and the communities uh, that you work for. Then I think for healthcare professionals, it's already been highlighted. We need to call it out when we see it. We need to ensure that we are advocates for the communities where we come from, uh, but not only communities where we come from. If we look at all the big revolutions that have happened for marginalized communities, they have not only been about marginalized communities shouting out for themselves. It has also been about those people who are in privileged positions saying this is not right. Mm -hmm. Health inequalities are bad for all of us. They are not just bad for those people who are affected by them directly. They affect all of us. And so it will take healthcare professionals, whether you are in a commissioning role, having a say on what services are provided, or you are delivering frontline healthcare, we need to make sure that we don't preside over situations where the care that you receive, the outcomes that you get, are dependent on things that are irrelevant. How would we feel if the care you got was dependent on whether you were right-handed or left-handed? There would be an absolute revolution. How would we feel if the color of your eyes determined your outcomes when it's got nothing to do uh, with the care pathway? So why do we accept it when there is skin color variations? Why do we accept it when there are differences because of someone's ability to speak the language or not? So I would really challenge our colleagues who are healthcare professionals to really call it out and not preside over situations where you are seeing very clearly that outcomes are not the same uh, for, for, for the patients that we are serving. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll just finish off by saying keep up the great work. It's been great listening. Uh, I've learned a lot today uh, and some of that I'll take back into my day-to-day uh, -day practice to make sure that we make a difference. Thank okay. you. So we have a few questions, so I may kind of quickly, I'm going to do them as quickly as possible. So the first question is, which are the countries with the best data? Stuart, because I know you know the answer to that one. Which are the countries with the best data? For LGBT, it's not the UK. So, there's, so uh, I think uh, Denmark does it pretty well, to be honest. Um, that's what we tend to do. Also, even in America, if you have a federally funded uh, healthcare system, they have to collect sexual orientation and trans status. They don't necessarily ever do it, but it just shows that the system is possible. Yeah. And I think you said the Netherlands as well. Yeah, the Netherlands is really good. That's where we get a lot of our stuff with regards to breast cancer risk in relation to trans women and also some prostate factors as well. Thank you. How do you collect data on discrimination by healthcare professionals when self-reporting is inherently biased? And should this be check if people don't realize they're biased. Adrian, I'm going to come to you with that one. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do this in the US all the time. This is every year we have national, nationally representative data of people's racist attitudes. And again, you don't say, are you racist, right? There's very, very, I mean, uh, there is still a small percentage of Americans. It's about, it's, it's not small, let's say. It's, it's a small percentage compared to more nuanced forms of racism. So about 20% of Americans hold old-fashioned, biologically-based racist attitudes. Almost 70% of Americans surveyed hold systemic racist attitudes. They hold colorblind racist attitudes. They hold laissez-faire racist attitudes. And this is self-reported survey data. So you ask them, on a scale from one to five, how much do you agree with the following statement? Jews, Italians, and Irish people have, have made their way up in America. Black people should do the same. How much do you agree or disagree with that statement? And they will, they will give you a, a symbolically racist answer. So we should be doing this in the, in the UK. And there is some data um, we're working with at King's College London right now that, that they've collected some of this, this stuff. So it is possible. Thank you so much. Um, and I don't know who wants to answer this, but is there any national reporting of discrimination or mechanism in place for patients to flag? Now, someone said recently there's a yellow card system. Does anyone know about this yellow card system? Because uh, Mr. Suresh Suresh, which is an amazing surgeon, he actually said, shared something. I've never heard of the yellow card system where if there's an issue. Does anyone know if there's a reporting? I don't know if you know this, um, Professor Kanongo Georgette of in the mechanism in place for patients to flag this, other than PALS, obviously. Yeah, it doesn't have there isn't? No? Okay. We will find so out. Yellow, we will report back. The yellow, yeah, the yellow card system is for like drug allergies and things like that, so I don't, I don't think oh. you can report from there, but okay. I'll, I will investigate. 
Thank you very much. How do we take, and this is a back for you, Georgia and Professor, because I think, how do we take the onus of the change off the patient and put it in the hands of professionals? Is this for education at medical and nursing school? We've got Nutritech in the house here who are trying to educate doctor, younger doctors about diet and lifestyle, but how do we extrapolate this? Do you think that we need to change this kind of education in medical schools, or what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think... Um, so I was going to say, I think, yes, it definitely has to start at medical school. I mean, we, I mean, if I think back to things that I was taught in medical school, um, some things were almost like formulaic. So, you know, when you're doing your exams, if you see a question about an Asian person, then invariably TB was somewhere in the answer. You know, if you something about HIV, invariably, you know, they've just traveled to Africa or come back, you know, from a brothel or something in Thailand. So, you know, it, these things do start and they start, you know, they they start socially as you're growing up, but then you know you enter into certain institutions, and then these things then get reinforced. Um, so I know certainly um, I'm being sound a bit old now, but the younger generation, you know, they're they're a bit more kind of on this sort of thing. I mean, recently a medical student actually just published like a whole dermatology textbook on changes that you see in darker skins. Um, so they're definitely a bit more vocal and a bit more questioning about why these sorts of things are being taught to them and why other things are not. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly I would say that, you know, for, you know, medical school, nursing colleges, things like that definitely will help with changing um, attitudes. And generally, I think that society has to change as well, because clearly healthcare professionals come from society. People, so. just people. 1.4 million, right, in the UK, in the system. So, and I'm just going to ask quickly for a soundbite from Char uh, Charlene, Brad and Stuart. What is going to help in feeling safe to engage? Anyone can go first. Oh, I can for that. So for me, I think if we're talking about engaging with the system and sharing the yeah. data, the thing that I always push when I'm teaching healthcare professionals is make sure people understand how the data is being used and where it's going as well. And especially when we think about trans people, if they have a gender recognition certificate, you can't share their trans status or their gender history without their permission. It breaks the law. So we have considerations like that to take into account. But ultimately, we have to make sure that people understand where their data is going, who's going to see, and why we're asking it. We're not asking it just for an awareness and curiosity. We're asking it because there can be clinical impact. And if you sell that to people that way, they understand, okay, well, it's being used for a good cause and are more likely to share. Thank you, Brad. What was the question again? Sorry. In what is going to help in feeling safe to engage? Because one of the things that you said was lack of trust. Um. Um, I think uh, amongst so many other actions, um, I, I think for me it's action speaks louder than words. I think words can sometimes be quite hollow. I think if you see um, healthcare professionals or the system engaging with um, marginalized and vulnerable communities, you'll feel much safer to engage in that pathway. So I think it's, um, we, can, we can say as many words, um, but it's about actions at the end of the day. Charlene. I would say also um, to do surveys as well, are they patient led? Are you getting these communities involved? Um, I think that, that's, that's huge as well. Um, that would make it easier for, I mean, certain questionnaires, it's like you go through it and it's like, there's no other, there's no other option mm. other than this. And this doesn't relate to me, but I have to tick a box. And this isn't the right result. You're not gonna get the right result because I can't be honest because there's no other options available yeah. as well. So it's, again, is it patient led? Is it, you know? Helped in that way. Yeah, and I think we're, you know, as patients, we're the expert in our bodies and ourselves. So mm. I think that's important. There are more questions, but I'm also conscious of time. W what are we allowed to do? Okay, so if patient ethnicity data is also collected, can hospitals be ranked on outcomes for diverse groups? I have no idea if anyone, do you know the answer to this, Adrian? The, so the ethnicity data that the NHS collects is abysmal. So we um, did a, an FOI of NHS trusts, and we'd see country of origin, it would say Africa. You'd see be blank for 30% of the patients. I mean, it was, it's, it's so bad, and this is all over the country. So there's been lots of recent articles and op-eds coming out about how poor the ethnicity data is, is collected in the first place. But again, um, this is a 
two-way street. First of all, it's the people collecting the data don't know what they're doing. Um, they obviously are racist. Um, and then it's also people's lack of ability to engage because they, they're terrified of what could happen if, if they do present as coming from a country with a high rate of a certain disease or whatever else. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's collected very, very poorly currently. It's only about 30% of patients, or 50% is like accurate. So I've got a question that I'm not entirely sure of. Is it because they're scared of admitting their mistakes and discrimination so that they're scared that you'll sue? I don't really understand that. I'm sorry, I'm going to abandon um, that I, question. I, but I, but, but I, uh, Brad, has a, Brad has something to say. Well, I was just, just going to jump on that in that I think it's really important to note that this conversation, we are being critical friends to the NHS. Mm -hmm. I think it's about making sure that this conversation is done in good faith because we want the system to thrive. Um, I'm here because of the NHS and medical technology. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, like, I, I, I love the system, but we want it to improve. Um, an NHS leader once told me that the NHS is like a super tanker and getting it to turn takes days, weeks, and, and, that, and that's true. So I think this conversation has to have balance in that just because it is a super tanker and it takes time does not mean we should be complacent, is we have a right, it's in the NHS constitution, to have good care and to have Free, uh, free care at the point of use and to make sure that's good quality health care. And I think that boils down to that really. Everybody deserves to have the same health care. And I think that's quite important actually because there's treatment and then there's treatment. So, you know, there are treatments, there's medicines, there's surgery, but then it's the way that treatment, the treat, how you treat the patient is whether or not they engage in that treatment as well. So, um, absolutely, I think... I always say that, you know, there is a human being that's like sitting across the way from you. And if you do truly think about people as relatives, as sisters, as mothers, as brothers, you know, then as, as long as you've got a good relationship with that family, you know, you're going to do what you can to, to help them to get better or to get through a difficult time. So, I mean, when I'm teaching medical students, certainly that, that is exactly what I say to them is that, you know, th th these are human beings and you have to, you've got to treat them as such. I know, I don't know if any questions from the floor, but I, I do feel like this is a good time to go, go for it. ...do to help improve the data collection. So if you could say that again with the mic on. <laughs> um, what do you think the charities can do to help improve the data collection? <laughs> So wait, wait let, let's do, okay, Brad, Stuart, then we'll come to anyone else. I feel like there's lots of people who want to say something. really jumped out of my seat for that one. Um, I, I think just work better together. Um, I think uh, share better. And there are already many, many examples of people working together in coalitions, um, in um, consortiums. But I just think better working together, uh, more effective working together, um, no matter how big, no matter how small. Uh, for me, it's for organizations to be the organization they want to see. So they should aspire to be the leader in their sector. And then that way they can support the people around them so they can upskill themselves rather than waiting for someone else to take the risk and then see if it works and then follow suit. And simple things like we've talked about monitoring so much. There are monitoring standards out there available. So there is one that's trans-inclusive from the LGBT Foundation. And then also it's thinking about intersex inclusion. It's about thinking not what is the current zeitgeist of inclusion that everybody's going into, but how do we go further? How do we make sure that we're doing the best we can do to support the people we're supporting? Anyone else want to answer that last question? Professor Kananga, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I make no apologies for defaulting back to what the last uh, 18 months or so have taught us. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of community goodwill, uh, organizations working very closely together uh, across organizational boundaries. We have seen data being shared about individuals uh, conditions so that they could be shielded. We have seen information about immunizations being shared. We have seen voluntary and community sector working very closely with local authorities, working with health, with hospitals, because we had a sense of imminent danger uh, and we had a sense of common purpose. Now, all of a sudden, when we get over this, we then go back to, well, actually, this is not a priority and that's not a priority. I think. If we can can and bottle all the stuff that we did in response to COVID-19, all that goodwill and the data sharing, then we can go a long way. 
But I think if we reset the system to where it was before, sadly, we'll start to see the same issues uh, that we had before. We wouldn't be here where we are in terms of our COVID-19 response had not everyone pulled their weight, including organizations such as yours. So how do we make sure that we learn from that uh, and we use that approach for dealing with all the other public health challenges that we face? And I think that's a beautiful place to uh, end that because I think we saw such amazing community spirit throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and which some of which is continuing on now. So we have one question, sorry, <laughs> go for it. Okay. I just have one question, so... If you could just share who you are and where you come oh, from, then that'd be um, great. Yeah, so my name is Carolina, I'm Colombian, um, and I'm part of the Trexa community. I also have leukemia and a bone marrow transplant. Um, and I'm just like in awe of hearing all of this because even though, well, I've never thought about this, but obviously I'm part of a very like minority community now that I realize because obviously there's no one that is Latin. And this is one of the questions that I wanted to ask. Like, from everything that I heard that you guys are talking, like you didn't actually talk about the other box because you know, when I go and you know, I have to fill in the form, there's no Latin, there's no Hispanic, there's no Colombian, there's all, like, what's your ethnicity? And I never know what my ethnicity is because it's like, hey, I'm Colombian, I'm Latin, like, and there's other. So what happens with that other data? Because I'm assuming that if you were talking about you know, Asians and African communities, like 15%, 30%, something like that, you said. So what happens with that other? So that just gets discarded. Like, who are we? Like, what do they do with our data? I do have to say, I had the best treatment. I've never had any, I've never felt any sort of discrimination or anything. So I am very grateful for the NHS, like you said. I'm here thanks to them. But I now I'm questioning like myself, like, oh, actually, you know, what happens with the people that maybe wasn't as lucky as me, and they're part of that extremely, you know, little community of people that is not Asian or black or white or we're just simply, you know, like a dot here. So I just wanted to ask what happens with the other box. Adrian, I think that's for you. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually uh, did my PhD at the University of Miami. So I lived among, you know, a large percentage of La Latina, Latino population. And coming here, the word BAME, lit I mean, it's exclusionary, right? So people, people like you, also people who are native and, and so on and so forth, and indigenous. But yeah, the data, if, if you do not have enough people in your data category, you are excluded. I mean, that, that is absolutely correct. So. It's, it's, you know, I think this idea that you gave of this patient-led surveys, and, and if, you, if, you, if there's any way you can work with Trevsoc or anyone else to collect data from your community so, so you can pass it on to us and we can publish those studies with you. So I, I think collaboration between um, healthcare professionals, clinicians, academics, and patients is really the only way that I see this forward. But yeah, they need, they need to get rid of that BAME acronym completely. <laughs> and what would you replace it with? I, I um, like the word racial, uh, racialized, uh, racially minoritized, because mm. that means that you're not a racial minority by default, but someone has minoritized <laughs> you, that you are actively being discriminated against. So I like RM. And I think, you know, the global majority are people of color, just to put it out there. <laughs> um, I know there's a couple more questions. Daryl, please uh, tell them a little bit who you are. Um, my name is Daryl Edwards. Um, that's about all I want to say about myself, really. <laughs> but um, I do have a question in relation to um, reaching out to communities who, who um, feel disenfranchised. So, for example, if we look superficially at some of the data, which tells us the outcomes are different for certain populations, uh, but usually that's because maybe there's late diagnosis at a later stage, um, they're less likely to have a referral to consultants, for example, um, they're less likely to have screening. Um, what can we do to change the culture to ensure those communities have access to relevant information, which means they're more likely to want to participate in screening, more likely to want to go to their healthcare professional to say, oh, I have, I have a problem and I, and I hope you're not gonna ignore me when I tell you what I'm actually going through right now. Um, and how do we deal with a lot of the misinformation that exists in, re in relation to that? Professor Kananga, and then Stuart. 
Yeah, thanks. And hi, Daryl. Good to see you. Um, I've seen Daryl at Lifestyle Medicine Conferences. Great guy. He's so humble. Um, I think we could have uh, given him 30 minutes to introduce himself. But anyway, uh, great question. I, I mean, I, Sir Michael Marmot talks about uh, the causes of the causes. Uh, and, and during the pandemic, he even, as if it's a play of words, but actually he then talked about the causes of the causes of the causes. The reason why people don't participate in some of these programs isn't because they don't want to have a good life. But when you've got everything going against you, then sometimes your, even your own health is not the priority. When you are not so sure about where your next meal is coming from, where you're not so sure about the conditions in which you are living, then attending to a health appointment might not necessarily be the top of your priorities. So, so I think the, the, the agenda cannot be divorced from the social determinants and the social justice. And yes, absolutely, we need to raise people's awareness. We need to really understand the barriers to accessing services. We need to challenge the myths, uh, the misinformation. But if we only did that, then we are not really tackling the underlying root causes. So I think this whole agenda is tied up in the unequal opportunities, the discrimination that people feel, the lack of trust. And if we can address some of those underlying issues, as well as uh, do all those things that Darren has identified as barriers to access, then we can start to see a movement. If we only dealt with individual behaviors, then sadly we will be ignoring the context in which they are making those decisions. And I think the other thing is, are we going to the communities? Are we going to a mosque, synagogues, you know, at temples, all those places? Are we doing it in different languages? Are we raising awareness in a way that understand? What I noticed is that there are no healthy plates for um, black African, black African Caribbean or Asian people. And those have just been created in the last month, in the last month. And that's by people of our communities, and I've created one too. So it's things like that. But Stuart, you want to end quickly, Brad? Sorry. It's literally that. So it's about trying to find how we put positive health messaging inside the community. Because if just having posters that are very NHS branded with white people on them doesn't do enough, right? So there's things of going out to the community, but it's also how do you frame your message? So No Barriers is a screening service for people who are trans assigned female at birth and that's really good because they've done messaging where it's trans people on camera talking about the service talking about why it works there's another one where the icr did a video about prostate cancer risk in black men and they filmed it inside a barber shop and they appreciated that that's the place where people want to talk so it's making sure that you step out of your bias and your own sort of tunnel vision and you think okay well how does the message then get to the community we work with the community and we put it in the language they understand and in the context they want to hear it yeah, absolutely. And Brad? Just really quickly, jumping on that, because I think it's so, so important, is no matter how, and it's so important to question, always question, I think, because there might not be anything to uncover, but I always think there, there will be something, um, no matter how worldly or like fighting inequalities and, um, and using language I may think that I am capable of doing. Um, a very good friend with me stayed with me this weekend, and she's a recent amputee um, from cancer. Um, I had to take her around London, and I did not realize how inaccessible London transport is. It took me that lived experience and sharing that with her to help me understand that systems don't work for people. So completely step out of the silos, step out of our comfort zones, and question things. Thank you. Am I allowed to wrap up now? <laughs> there's, we could continue talking all night, and there's so many elements. And I know we didn't uncover all the kind of detail and some you know, break down the aggregated information, but I just want to say a huge thank you to all our panelists. Um, thank you for sharing so openly, authentically, honestly, and with the view of making, creating change. I really, really appreciate it. And just continuing on the theme that Professor Kananga started, with a small ripple, if we all have small, create small ripples together, we can create a tsunami, and we create a tsunami of change. So thank you to Charlene, Brad, Adrian, Stuart, Georgia, and Edward. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for Trekstop for uh, hosting us. I'm going to hand back to Jemima. Thank you so much to Toral for hosting this evening. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> and thank you so much to all of you for joining, and thank you for the amazing panel as well. Um, we will be sending out a questionnaire that you'll be receiving tomorrow because we believe, like um, 
Professor Sir Michael Marmot says, there is, can be no more important task for those concerned with the health of the population than to reduce health inequalities. And together, we can all do better and help make change. Thank you so, so much for this evening.